create, contribute, and happier. Hi, everyone. This is Heather Vickery, and you've tuned in to the Brave Files podcast. I'm glad you're here with us, and this is a really special, special week. So thank you so much for tuning in. Some people inspire just by default. They just kind of can't help it. Imagine being a person that sees a problem and then in that very moment identifies a way to support or help or make a difference and then taking immediate and instant action. That's what this week's guest, Sean Spence, does. He is what he likes to call an everyday activist and he urges everyone to find a way to support their communities and give back to others in creative and unique ways on the spot right away. He says there's always something you can do to be part of making a difference. Sean started his activism at a really young age, and he has done everything from organizing HIV testing days back in the 80s to raising money for public radio by breaking world records, even to most recently starting blood drives, to support a lack of access to blood in his own community. He's done so much more than that. This conversation is full of everyday bravery, and it's full of discussion about how we can all choose to be a little happier. Tune in to hear more about that. Maybe not all the way happy, but a little happier, and how much choice we have in that. It's the small things that each and every one of us can do that make a difference in the world and that can make the world and ourselves happier and better. Before we get started, though, I want to remind all of you that my book release celebration is today, November 11th, 2021. We are celebrating the release of my new book, Fuck Fearless, Making the Brave Leap. If you are in the Chicagoland area, I invite you to join us tonight live 630 to 9 p.m. at Cribby Coffee here in Forest Park. We will also be streaming elements of the event on Instagram and Facebook, so you can tune in there as well if you are not local and you want to catch some of the celebration. Make sure you're following Vickery & Co. to join us virtually. Honestly, I'm still reeling with excitement over making number one bestseller in two categories and top 10 new release in seven different categories, including being top seven in women in business, which is a really hard category to crack, really feeling honored and excited. I couldn't have done it without all of you fans, supporters, people who bought the book, people who shared the book. You can still do that. You can still buy it. You can still share it. Visit vickeryandco.com slash fearlessbook to see all of your purchasing options and The paperback version of the book will officially be available on December 9th, which is my birthday. So if you want to wait for the paperback, you can do that as well. Just a quick reminder that for the live virtual book release celebration, we have partnered with Brave Space Alliance. They are a nonprofit organization that is trans-led, black-led, and they are a safe space in Chicago for black trans LGBTQ folks. They work towards educating and creating a safe community for Chicago's people of color and queer populations. And they have a multitude of important programs that foster growth and help those who have been underserved. So we have a recommended minimum $10 donation at the door. If you are virtual, you can also make a donation and support Brave Space Alliance. We will stream live uh, as Jay Rice from Brave Space comes and tells us about the organization. Really, really honored to be partnered with them for this incredible celebration. And last but not least, special thanks to our event sponsor, Cribby Coffee. I love Cribby. They are my local independent coffee shop. Uh, They're one of my favorite places to go. And they uh, are amazing in the community. They give a welcome jolt of caffeine and a vibrant sense of social awareness to those in the West Suburban Forest Park area. They are a welcoming and warming destination which serves up coffee using beans prepared with their own patented air roasted technique. And they support local and national causes dedicated to eradicating systems of racism and supporting the lives of the LGBTQ community. Want to know the really cool thing? Even if you're not local, you can get Cribby Coffee 
coffee beans. Their delicious coffee can be shipped all over the world. So visit CribbyCoffee.com and you can get your specialty brew such as the Love is Love brew or the Black Lives Matter blend. So many wonderful ways to be involved and drink amazing coffee. All right, folks, let me introduce you to Sean Spence. This is Heather Vickery, and you're listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. When we choose bravely in big and small ways, it powerfully elevates our lives. I hope these stories connect with you and encourage you to embrace bravery in every possible way, day after day. Together, we can build a movement of courageous living that enriches both our lives and our communities. And if you enjoy the show, I ask you to please share it with others. Maybe think of someone who you want to choose bravely right alongside you. Thanks for tuning in. Now here's the show. Friends, we oftentimes don't realize what types of bravery we're capable of until we have no choice in the matter. Now, this show is often about embracing everyday bravery, the things that we never really imagined could or should be or feel brave. And for some folks, waking up is brave, saying yes or no, trying something new, stopping something, setting boundaries, or making a sales call. And then there are things that are quite obviously brave. And that's how I feel about today's guest, Sean Spence. I was first introduced to Sean through a mutual friend and past guest of the Brave Files, Mason Aid. Shout out to Mason. Sean is a social activist, a philanthropist, a Guinness Book of World Record holder. We're going to talk about that. And I personally think he's one hell of an inspiration. Also, I'm a really big fan of his new favorite word, and I bet he's going to tell you what it is. Sean, welcome to the Brave Files. (laughs) Hi, Heather. I'm so happy to be here. You know, and I have a meeting uh, on Thursday with our friend Mason, who is a wonderful past guest of yours. I love that. I love that. I think you're going to talk to Mason, well, maybe on the same day this episode airs. We're recording the week before. So there you go. Maybe uh, maybe Mason can listen before well, I will or after make them that listen call. to it. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, so I teased everybody. Tell everybody what your new favorite word is and why. Well, Heather, because of <laughs> you, uh, you know, you really have reintroduced me to fuck. <laughs> Which, how can you not love that word? It is like the word of our generation, Heather. (laughs) I love it, and it makes me happy. And for folks who don't already know you, I just have to say, uh, you're this kind of, well, I would never say you're quiet. I suspect no one in your life says you're quiet. Not a lot, no. (laughs) But you sort of have this well-balanced, reserved online persona where uh, you sort of tow the political line. I know you have really strong feelings, but you you sort of maneuver yourself around networks very carefully. And I it just tickles me to hear you love the word fuck. <laughs> oh, I do. <laughs> Heather, you know what that really is about? It, it really is about, I want to learn from people. Mm. So For example, I've got a very close friend of mine. We just went and had drinks yesterday, and he is about as hard right as you can get, which I am not. You and I probably agree on 98% of everything. (laughs) And, you know, he's a Trump supporter. He's all of those things that really are very different from what I am. But I figured out very early on that if I was going to be friends with him, which we were working together at the time, and so it was either be friends with him or you know not talk to him, and I just decided I'm going to just listen. I'm going to ask him questions. And so I really never share my opinion with him any more than I have to. I just ask him about his, which has taught me so much and has made him one of my closest friends without having to agree with him on everything. Well, now that's an interesting topic and certainly not necessarily the direction I anticipated going down today, especially since this is the second time we've done this interview. Uh, We had some technical errors last time and and we needed to come back to the table. But any excuse to talk to you. Oh, Heather, I could talk to you every day. (laughs) You flatter me, Sean. So 
I can I can appreciate and respect and admire that. I all I always think that we should listen, ask really good questions, and listen more. We can learn a lot from one another. But what is he learning from you? How are you sharing what your values are and what's important to you? Or does he only get that privilege? You know, I honestly don't know that that is a priority of mine, Heather. Okay. I do a variety of things in my life that share my views on things. I do a variety of things that are intended to shape the world in one way or another and to help shape the opinions of others. But I don't always have to have that in my relationships. And in some ways, that's a little bit selfish on my part. Mm. But I want to learn from other people. I know what my opinions are. And, you know, I think that really being his friend has not brought me over to his side. But in a way that he never would have expected, it has helped to shape my opinion of things because I just disagree with him so darn much. And the more he goes into detail about things, um, the more it helps me understand my own views of things. And, um, you know, I don't know if that's necessarily good or bad, but it, it leads to a really interesting and what I feel like is a rich relationship for mm. me. And he likes it because he likes people who agree with him. So on we go. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't know that you don't. Right. You know, it's funny. He actually has introduced me at various points as being, you know, Sean Sean doesn't realize that he's actually a Republican. And I'm actually not really either party, but he has often introduced me as, as that because he thinks I agree with him. But what I've said to him, I have explained to him, he just forgets. He and I do have a lot of the same values. We come from a lot of the same place. We care about hard work. We care about charity. We care about making the world a better place. We care about all kinds of things. And what I have found from him and many others like him that I'm close friends with is that we can often share a lot of the same values and we just have very intense disagreements about how those values should become policy. Mm. And so how, how those things should be shaping our government and our laws and those things. So you can have somebody who cares very much about uplifting everybody from poverty. You know, my friend would say that as a priority for, for him is helping lift people out of poverty. We just have a very different idea of how that should be done and how it could be done. Yeah. That's interesting, and I, and sometime I want to talk with you more about that. I, I I will I will button that up by saying uh, I think that the ability to do that might be it might lie in the fact that you as a as a cis white man are not likely to be in any of the groups that are directly harmed by his policies and his choices. I think you're right, Heather. I am well aware of the position that I am in. I've often said, you know, I'm a white guy with a little bit of money. And that puts me in a very different place than most people. And I'm well aware that people, that there are a lot of people who couldn't have that relationship that I have mm -hmm. with this friend that we're talking about. And I'm in a very different kind of position. And it works for me, but it's not going to work for everybody. Yeah, it wouldn't work for me. We'd have a problem with somebody whose <laughs> political leanings want to take my family away. But one of the things I love about, about you so much is you have, you have this magical way of introducing people to all sorts of creative ways, social activism at its finest and philanthropy. Tell folks a little bit about the work that you do. I mean, there's so much. We've got Armchair Telethon. We've got all sorts of things. You were just telling me before we started 12 events and did you say 12 days? No, I said 12 months. 12 months. That's better. Because <laughs> Although like, we could what? do, maybe we'll do that. That sounds like oh a great gosh. idea, Heather. <laughs> you have, you, you're a glutton for punishment. Tell folks a little bit about how you got into this work and you know, really what it's all about for you. Well, you know, I started doing a lot of activism in 
college. Uh, I got very involved in student government and with various student organizations. I was a member, and in fact, I'm the only person at that time, and I don't know if, how many others there have been, I was a member of the Legion of Black Collegians, and I am not black, and I was a, mem a member of... Uh, Gala, which was the Gay and Lesbian Alliance, and I am heterosexual. But those things were important to me, right? So I was getting involved in those things. And I always think about somehow the first big event I can think about was probably in 1989 in my sophomore year in college. And I helped to organize an HIV test, testing day, where people could come to a come to a, a central location in the same way that we do blood drives and get an HIV test. And that was a very different and much more difficult thing than mm -hmm. uh, this was, you know, again, it was 1989. So it was a very different thing. And so that put me into contact with so many uh, different kinds of folks who had different kinds of lives than I than I have had, and got me involved in something that was incredibly important. But trying to take a practical approach, realizing that I cannot solve this massive problem that is still a massive problem today, thirty years later or whatever. But I can do something to try to chip away at it, to try to help some people who are dealing with that problem. And so over and over and over through my life, I've tried to do that with different things, whether it is you know a bunch of things I've done in the disability world or things that I've done. You know, I did a blood drive when we first did our very first interview <laughs> yeah. the other day. I did a blood drive because we're having a blood crisis in the United States. I'm not going to solve the blood crisis, but I can make a difference for somebody. And, and so that's what I try to do. And often it is through creating some large kind of flashy, splashy event that gets lots of media relations, media attention. Uh, maybe it raises money. It gets lots of people involved and really tries to maybe hopefully do something specific, like in, in the case of this blood drive I did, it collected a bunch of blood. But then also it got a lot of community attention and helped people understand that our nation is in the middle of a big blood crisis. So those are the kinds of things I try to do. I love that. And one of the things that you're really conscious of is helping folks identify how they can make a difference right now. I mean, so often we see these big, huge problems. We see them in our communities, sometimes in our households, certainly in our country and around the globe. And we think, well, I just can't do anything about that. And that's like the polar opposite of the Sean Spence <laughs> <laughs> approach. You are like, there's always something you can do, even if it feels small. Can you speak to that? Sure. That is, I, you said that very well, Heather. That is something that has been extremely important important to me. Um, you know, it, it, honestly, it goes a little bit back to my three words that I thought of just specifically for today, create, <laughs> contribute, happier, right? So let's be creative. Let's think about something we can do. Like in that case, it was I heard about the blood crisis, which I really did not know. And within a week, I thought of, oh, you know, let's create an event where we get lots of media attention, get lots of people to give blood, and this is going to contribute. This is going to do something for the problem. This is going to let a lot of people know about the problem. And to me, that honestly is the kind of thing that makes me happier. I always say, if you really want to get happier, if you're feeling bummed out, if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling whatever, and this is not to minimize depression by any means, and you know, we can talk about this, I specifically, I said happier, because not everybody can be truly happy, yeah. but I do believe that everybody can be happier than they are, because we can do all kinds of things. And sometimes it's taking drugs, right? Sometimes, or, you know, legal drugs. Sometimes it's <laughs> taking medication. But I think <laughs> that one of the most important things we can all do to be happier than we might be right this moment is do something for somebody else. Go yeah. volunteer, go give blood, go do, go help your friend do their grocery shopping, whatever it is. And so do your small thing. Think about a problem that is important to you. Think of a way that can do anything at all to alleviate that problem for any number of people and do it. You'll help and you'll be happier. You'll feel good. 
Yeah. yeah. And you have a, a little bit of a hashtag, happier by choice, right? Yeah. Hashtag there. Yeah, that's something. I created that, um, happier by choice. And what I did, I'm actually almost done. I have created a list of, it was like 1,400 uh, different happier by choice thoughts that were all, um, not that somebody else didn't also have the same original idea at some point, but I created all of these quotes and I've been posting those on Facebook for over three years and it's it's almost done. I'm almost done with my list, so I don't know what I'm going to do next related to that. But You could just, just start over. It's been I, three I, years. Nobody remembers about that the first yeah, ones. <laughs> exactly right. Nobody's been keeping track of it. Um, but I really just do believe that it is our choice to be happier. And again, we don't want to minimize true depression. My dad wrestled just miserably with depression through my entire life at a time when I was too young even to know about it. But, you know, he was persevering and he was taking medication and he was volunteering at, at Rotary and for the local football games and, you know, for going to Haiti to do things. And, you know, he was trying to do something just to, to help the world because he knew that if he helped somebody else, that would make him feel at least a little bit better. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, and, and I appreciate the caveat. I appreciate that that is easier said than done for a lot of people. But sometimes I, I find just getting out of our own way and out of our own headspace creates an awful lot of growth opportunity and an awful lot of happier opportunity. All right. So while we're talking about all these cool ways that you've chosen to be a social activist and a philanthropist and you help others do that in the moment, I teased at the beginning of this conversation that you are a Guinness Book of World Record holder. Can yeah. you can you tell us about that? Sure. Yeah, that's an example of really what we're talking about. Uh, to an extent, I um, went to work uh, for two years. I managed, I was general manager of a community radio station. And there's NPR, which is a public radio station that we're all used to with fresh air and car talk and whatever. The community radio station is similar but different. It's almost always run almost entirely by volunteers, and it's different from National Public Radio, but it is run by volunteers, it's supported by individuals giving their money, and so I went to work for this uh, this community radio station because they were on the verge of bankruptcy, and so I didn't have any knowledge of, of radio stations at all, but I know how to raise money, and I'm a business guy, and I know how to run a business. So I went there, and so they were on the verge of bankruptcy, and then when I left, they had $150,000 in the bank, and they're doing very well today. But one of the things that I knew we had to do is we had to, what could we do to bring attention to this radio station? And so I just started Googling Guinness World Record radio. And I looked at all kinds of different records. And then I found that there is a record for most people interviewed over 24 hours on live radio. And so I found somebody who had created that record in Florida and they interviewed like 360 people or something like that over the course of 24 hours, which think about that, do the math. That is a lot of people to interview over 24 hours. That is a lot of people. It is. And we interviewed, well, and it's not we, it's I, although I had lots and lots of help, but it had to be one person doing the interviewing. So over the course of 24 hours, I sat in a chair. I only got up to go to the bathroom one time. I didn't eat or drink anything. And I interviewed 421 people. And we couldn't even ask the same question twice. So I had like Whoa. 13 or 1400 questions. And I just went straight down the list and asked everybody three questions. And hustled them out there. Everybody had like three minutes. And it was just an amazing time that brought together. And here's another thing that I try to do, Heather. It brought together just about every kind of person you can think of, right? Mm. It brought together people of every color, people of, you know, there were homeless people who interviewed. So people, and there were rich people who interviewed, and there were Republicans who interviewed, and there were Democrats who interviewed, and there were people of every kind of everything you can think of. And um, at various points, there were like 50 people all in line uh, down the center of the radio station and hanging out and wanting to talk. And it was just an amazing, cool. incredibly diverse day where we were just sharing with each other as a community things that were 
important to us. That was really the goal. I love that. I think that's a lot of fun. You really enjoy challenges, don't you, Sean? I do. I do. I, <laughs> I do. And I failed um, at least as many times as I've succeeded. You know, I've told you this story, Heather, uh, it's, but it's, it's, it is a defining story of my life. My mother <laughs> said something to me that really only a mother can say to you, and I just remember, and this was five, 10 years ago, whatever it was, and we're talking on the phone, and my mother, who is 82 years old now, says, Sean, you just impressed me so much. She said, you fail so often. <laughs> she said, and you just get up and go on and do whatever the next thing is. And that is true, right? So really, it's not great to hear anybody tell you how often you fail, but that's right. And so, you know, we're talking about things where I failed. Well, I succeeded, and, and I did set a world record with that radio thing. But several years before that, I decided, and we turned this into a fundraiser for the local school district and for, the, for Columbia Public Schools here in Columbia, Missouri, where I live. And what we were going to do is the most people gathered in one place dressed like superheroes. Oh, that my kids would love that. Oh, they would have. <laughs> and so think about this. It really was kind of what you would imagine. We ended up having, it was over 800 people on the football field of one of the local high schools. And so it was, it was everything from babies in superhero costumes to my mother who was in her 70s and we had 80 year olds. I don't know if we had anybody over 90, but we definitely had several who were over 80 dressed in every kind of superhero costume you can imagine. And then there, afterwards, we had pictures of, here's a group of 30 people from one year old to 60 or 70 years old dressed like Spider-Man. And here's a group of Supermans. And here's a group of, you know, everything. And then here's everybody all together. It was just an amazing day. And we were all there supporting public education in our local public school system. And, and so, again, that was just a little thing where I thought, oh, well, let's do this fun thing. And then we failed, Right. The record was like 1,300, and we had over 800 people there. But it was still an amazing day that raised money for the public schools, where everybody had so much fun, and we've got all these great pictures. And nobody who was there looks back and says, yeah, we did, we, it was horrible because we didn't break the record. No, yeah. they look back and say, remember that day when there were 800 of us dressed like crazy comic book superheroes? You know, that's what they yeah. say. Yeah, I, I love that. I appreciate. And of course, I'm a big fan of failing forward. And it is about the experience, right? It isn't necessarily about the reward yep. or the award. It's about the moment and the and the growth opportunities together. Now, we haven't brought this up because this really isn't uh, something that you feel defines you. But I, th I think for listeners, it's important to know that Sean does all of this work while living with MS. And I'll let you tell folks, but you're fairly reliant on walking support or wheelchair, right? So how yes. does this or does this play into how you live your life? Sure, Heather. I am, um, you know, I was diagnosed with MS in 2003. I was diagnosed with MS. I am mostly a wheelchair user. I don't need to use it in the house. I walk out from my house to my car every day. But like I'm sitting in it right now because to walk more than about 20 feet, I have to use a wheelchair. And I just honestly, I've got other symptoms and I've got other things that I deal with and that other people would consider a struggle. But I really honestly don't think about it very much. I don't think about myself as being uh, disabled or having a disability. I'm not running from it, but I just think we all have something, right? And maybe it's um, something that's related to physical. Maybe it's because you're living in poverty. Maybe it's because you've got depression. Maybe it's because you've got whatever it is you've got. Maybe it's just because you're a jerk, right? <laughs> I would much rather be a wheelchair user than, than a be jerk. a jerk, right? That's, Hell yeah. <laughs> that's right. So we all deal with something. And so I do have to figure out often how I'm going to do this or that because I am a wheelchair user. But you've got to figure out any number of things because maybe you're not 
you can't bench press 300 pounds and so you've got to do something where it would be better if you were physically stronger or for somebody else they have to figure out how to do something but they're not as good a public speaker as they would like to be or you know for whatever we're trying to do in our lives we have to overcome something or it's probably not worth doing and this is just mm. my thing one of my things mm. i like that we have to well do I like that? Let's explore that for a second. <laughs> Please. We have to overcome something or it's just not worth doing. I think I like that, but I like it with <laughs> a few caveats. I mean, I think for me, for the work that I do, Brave is my business, I would say, yeah, most of the things that are worth doing require some effort or discomfort of some sort. And I would often say that's embracing some level of fear in one way or another. But when I think about things like uh, I love bedtime snuggles and reading to my daughters at bedtime, I don't have to overcome anything to love that. It's well, worth doing. Well, that's true. That's true. There are plenty of things. But let's look at it in a broader sense, Heather. You're a mother. And there are all kinds of things things that you have to overcome on a daily basis. It's <laughs> true. Sometimes I have to mother. overcome wanting to kill them because they refuse dinner to love want to snuggle at bedtime. <laughs> right. And you're going to have to deal with <laughs> I never actually your... want to kill my kids, y'all. I never I really do. Not. Of course you don't, Heather. <laughs> but you have to deal, you know, your kid is going to be struggling with school and mm. that's something that you have to overcome. And one of your kids may have some sort of health issue and one of your kids is unhappy because they don't get invited to the dance or, you know, there are always things that you're going to have to overcome constantly mm. as a mother. But is there anything you do that is more worth worth doing than being a mother? I bet there's not. Not for me. But no. And I know that's not true for everybody, but not for me. It's it's the greatest thing ever. I, I, I like that as a general concept. I do. I think there are some caveats to it, but um, I do believe that we gain more from from pushing through and getting a little bit uncomfortable and doing things that feel like a challenge. Yes, I think so too, Heather. I totally agree with you. But I will also throw in um, my own little caveat is that we want to make sure, just as I was talking about earlier with um, being happier, being happy and dealing with depression and dealing with all those things, I don't want to minimize the fact that there are plenty of things that people have to overcome that they would absolutely prefer to not have to Absolutely. overcome. Not everything we have to overcome, not every challenge is not something we would love to get rid of. You know, somebody who has had to deal with violence or any, you know, just the list is incredibly long. Absolutely. I'm not saying that every every experience is not a good experience. Every experience is not a worthwhile experience. But there are a lot of things that we overcome that just make us stronger. Yeah, it's true. Uh, one of the fun things that I that I'd love for you to share with the audience is you have one really deep desire that you've challenged yourself on with your wife, specifically related to what you're experiencing from MS, uh, and you're and I just think it's a really beautiful challenge. Will you share that? Sure, and this is also a good example of what we're talking about. With sometimes things work out exactly the way we want them to, and I. Oftentimes they do not. I uh, can walk short distances. I believe that my walking problems are a combination of the damage to my nerves caused by MS, but also they are a result of the fact that because walking has gotten harder, I have walked less, mm -hmm. and it's created a cycle of my legs getting weaker and weaker, both because of the nerve damage and because my muscles get less toned month after month, year after year, because I don't exercise them as much. So that really dawned on me a year or so ago, and I really kind of understood that. And I believe I'm right, could be wrong, we'll still find out. But I started trying to figure out ways that I could exercise my legs more, because what I want to do, and this is one of the things I want to do more than anything else. It's one of my great things I want to do in my life is I really, I want to walk around the block with my wife holding her hand and, you know, yeah. 
ending up at our home together and, and just why we used to do that all the time. And I think about when we were dating and then, you know, because my legs have gotten progressively worse over the years and I was didn't own a wheelchair when she and I started dating and when we got married and, you know, it didn't happen for a couple of years. But you know what? I had planned, uh, my goal was to walk around the block with her by the end of the year. And that is not going to happen. Um, I've got two months. I'm nowhere close. There are ways that my legs are absolutely stronger. But that is still my goal. Just because I didn't accomplish it when I wanted to or didn't accomplish something in the way that I wanted to or whatever, if it's a worthwhile goal, and then sometimes you decide that something's not really that worthwhile. (laughs) And I've moved on from plenty of goals, believe me. (laughs) I love that. You don't have to do it just because you used to want to. That's right. That's exactly right. I've set plenty of goals aside, but this one is something I still want to try to do, and it'll be something that I continue to work on throughout next year. I love that. I I love all of that. I, I love that you have this desire because it's just special, just because you want to, because you want to have that experience in that moment with your wife. And uh, I think you feel very aware of the fact that when you accomplish that goal, it'll likely be the last time you can do so. Uh, maybe not, but, you know, probably. And that you didn't hit that target date, but that you're still working, that you haven't given up and that it's all still worthwhile. And and there's so many wonderful lessons in that. I'm curious. You do so much for other people. You're so active. You're one of the most active people I've ever encountered. Heather, I really am amazing. Isn't, isn't that true? <laughs> <laughs> well, but your mother thinks you're a big old failure, so. <laughs> oh, she's going to hate that. I'm kidding. I uh, know. Mom, I love it. I think at your age, you have every right to say what you want to say in the way you want to say it. And also, I know your intent was good. Yes. What a wonderful thing to say. You, it's like this song, you get knocked down, but you get up again. <laughs> like, That's right. I do over, love that. Over and over. So I, I love it. And also, your son says the word fuck. You should know that. Oh, my. you're going to get me <laughs> so much trouble, Heather. But I do. So on we go. Uh, but my question for you was, do you have any particular daily sort of self-care routines or grounding rituals or things that you do to, to help you stay sharp and on task with all of these things that you're up to? Well, I do a variety of things. One thing that I will say is that I do do a lot of things to try to benefit others, but in part, that is selfish, really. And I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm trying to be as truthful about this as I possibly can, Heather. I get so much joy out of that, and I think the vast majority of people do, and they just don't realize it. But then also, I have some, you know, I'm not rich at all, but I'm also not worried about paying the light bill. Yeah. So I have more time than somebody else might. And so somebody else might want to go play basketball or climb a mountain or whatever it is. And I don't really care about any of those things. And so these things that I do for other people are so much fun. I get to meet new people. I get to create something cool. I get to make the world a little bit of a better place. And so I, so really, like my mom always says... Sean, you're such a workaholic. And I say, Mom, all these things that I do, I'm getting paid to do a lot of what I do. I mean, I'm breaking the world record and whatever I don't, but like I work for a nonprofit organization right now and I started several companies and all those things, I get paid to do those things, whereas other people are doing them and they're just volunteering. They work all week so that they can volunteer doing things I get paid to do. Mm -hmm. And so I probably need to re-energize less than a lot of people do because I'm not digging ditches. I'm not running a cashier at Walmart all day. I'm not doing all of these things. I'm not working two jobs in the way or three jobs in the way that so many of my fellow people are. But that said, I keep daily to-do lists and it always makes me feel better when I finish it, but it keeps me focused on doing the things that I want to do that day. I meditate every morning and I've been doing that for a couple of years. I work very hard to make time to read things just for fun. So like this morning at 5 a.m., I read 25 pages of a new book that I just bought. What are you reading? Oh, this one's not as fun. I did just get finished with 
My Sister is a Serial Killer, which was a really wonderful, incredibly short novel that was a very fast read. I forget the name of the author, but that is the name of the book. My Sister is a Serial Killer. Okay. And it's all happening in Nigeria, and it's just a wonderfully written book. Now I'm reading a book about Michael Dell, who created Dell Computers, and he's recently written a book called be nice, but win, because that's what his mother used to say to him when he would leave the house to go play sports. She would say, be nice, but win. <laughs> and so that was a little motto for him. And so I'm enjoying that. And also reading about things that other people have accomplished yeah. really energizes me and, me and makes me feel better. Yeah. I know I'm getting ready to read a book that a friend of mine just wrote. What might that be, <laughs> Heather? Are you... Are you about to read Fuck Fearless? Don't you think I should? I I I shouldn't. I can't tell you what you should do, but I'm honored. I hope so. <sighs> yes, I'm ordering. I am ordering it. I'm excited about reading it. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate the support. I have to tell you, in my own moment of of vulnerability and transparency, people are starting to get it. They're posting pictures and they're tagging me and they're sending me messages and it's really exciting. And then I go. Oh my God, what if they don't like it? <laughs> like, <laughs> I worked so hard and I had so many people read it and I get so many wonderful endorsements for it. And then I'm like, what if they don't like it? So, well, you be should be super proud of yourself. Folks. You know, Heather, I wrote a book that I self published several years ago called Eventology. It was a book on event planning that was just a lot of fun. And, you know, I think I sold like 200 copies. <laughs> Yep, I but know was, how that feels. It was a great thing. I love doing it. <laughs> is it where can you get the book? What if somebody wants it? On my shelf at my house. I've got about 10 <laughs> copies left. <laughs> so it's not like you can't get it on Amazon or anywhere? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when people do that. Because now, you know, I did not publish through Kendall Direct Publishing, KDP, which is Amazon's publishing. Right. But now you do it, you can publish through them, and you can just leave it up, and people can find it. But I know other people who self-published and then just bought a bunch of copies and then they just have boxes of books in their house. I think it's amazing. I love that. No, I'm really proud and I'm, I'm excited. And writing a book is a hell of an accomplishment. Um, yes. I, I feel like I've turned myself inside out a little bit. So yeah. Well, now All you've right. got to start on the next one. No, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, uh, that's another really interesting thing. Normally in the month of November, I do NaNoWriMo. That's actually when I wrote Fuck Fearless and NaNoWriMo is National Novel Writing Month. And I don't, I'm a, I'm a call a rebel. They call me a rebel. I don't write a novel. I, I write nonfiction and I've mm -hmm. done it three years in a row and I made the conscious decision this year. We just launched the book and I, I'm tired and I'm working on restructuring my business and we're not, that's not, I'm not, I'm not Well, good this for month. you. That's yeah. what you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Reevaluate and make new decisions. You're not wed to doing a book every year. No. And I, and I won't be. <laughs> this is hard work, <laughs> but I, there'll probably be another one. I would never say never, but yeah, we're going to take a minute and it's going to be cool. But well, do you know what I said never to Heather? Uh, another thing I did was um, early on in my MS, I realized that I would uh, very likely not be able to do a variety of physical things because I could just see the way it was going. And I tried to think of things that I could do. And in the end, the short version of the story is I decided to ride my bike from St. Joseph, Missouri, where I was living at the time, to New York City. So I, and I was not a cyclist. I actually had to buy a bike for the trip because I, I didn't even own a bicycle. But I rode a bicycle. 1,500 miles from Missouri to New York. And when I was done with that, I said, I'm done. I'm never getting on a bike again. I felt no compulsion to, to figure out some new way to do it again. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> nope. I feel that. I love that. And I love that you can have an experience and go, I've done that now, and I'm ne I never need to do that again, and that's fine. Like, done and done. Yes, ma'am. And there's a lot to celebrate there. That's actually my next we're, – we're almost um, – out of time here. And my next question, which I love this question, is how do you like to celebrate? And the things that we're talking about, we're celebrating big wins, writing books, putting them out there, whether they're on your bookshelf or you can buy them, you know, online or in the bookstore, uh, deciding I've done this thing, I never need to do it again. Or how can I be helpful and supportive in this moment? How do you celebrate? Heather, honestly, I view my life. Um, I view my days as celebrations. Um, 
I am easily one of the most optimistic people that you know, and I have an awful lot of just day-to-day, even hour-to-hour sometimes joy, which, by the way, can be exceptionally annoying to others, but it is a real thing, and I try to take as much joy as I can out of my life. Now, when I really want to celebrate big things, it's my wife and I just doing something. We go to dinner together. We go on a trip together. We, whatever it is, and I do like to do things, but I really just think take time to enjoy every minute of your life, and as cliche um, and you know, saccharine as that can sound. <laughs> no, I love I it. I truly mean it. And I have been training myself, which I firmly believe you can train your brain over a long period of time in all kinds of ways. And I've trained my brain to enjoy minute by minute um, a lot more than I would have 30 years ago. Yeah. I love that. I appreciate that. Uh, and there are so many ways that if you feel celebratory in the moment, I think that, that that counts. It's a beautiful way to move move through our day and our lives. Sean, what's your favorite charitable organization to support? Well, today, and this may lead to another question from you, Heather, which I think you know I'm happy to take. You know, I'm working with the Salvation Army right now, and I may be here for the next 10 or 20 years. It is a decision that I've made to really dedicate a portion of my life uh, to helping people in poverty, and the Salvation Army is is one of the leading organizations in the country, and in fact, in the world, to deal with people in poverty. And so that's really my my thing right now. If I'm pushing something, I'm pushing the Salvation Army. All right. So here's the question for those of you listening. Um, we we did this in the last interview that didn't record properly. Um, you have declared, you have said that you are an ally. You are an LGBTQ plus supporter. And the Salvation Army does not have a good history with the LGBTQ plus community. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. I'd be happy to give it to you. What I, I would put that a little bit differently than you, Heather. Um, what I would say, I wouldn't say that it doesn't have a good history. I would say that there is some bad history there. The organization as a whole doesn't have policies. You can't say, oh, well, it used to discriminate as an organization against such and such, any kind of group, whether it's racially or LGBTQ plus or anything else. But as an organization that is national with hundreds and hundreds of individual entities all around the country, and then also in like 80 or 100 countries, there are examples of things that, frankly, I am not proud of, um, but they are not systemic problems. They are problems that, you know, if you've got you know, almost it's like you've got a family and there are mem- members of your family that do all kinds of things that you are not proud of. And in this case, it's the same kind of thing where there is some stuff that happened in San Francisco that I'm not proud of. And there's some stuff that happened in different parts of the country that I'm not proud of. But also the Salvation Army as a whole said, you know, that's not who we are. And they didn't support those things continuing. If they had, I would not be here. And and so we work very hard to be very, very inclusive and to not discriminate against anybody and to provide an amazing amount of services to the LGBTQ plus community, which it does. All right. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I just think folks might have been curious. So I'm glad we could clear that up. Sean, you're fun. We could talk all day. We could talk about a lot of things, but we are out of time. Will you share your three words with us one last time? Yes, absolutely. I would say that my three words are creative, contribute, and happier. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here with me and with Sean. And this is our call to you today to go out and do, I want to see you do two things because I think these things are really brave. One is how can you be just a little happier? How can you find and seek a little more happiness for yourself? And maybe you'll find it by doing something kind or thoughtful for someone else in your community. Look for those opportunities to give back and be supportive in the moment right now, you can be part of making the world and your community a better place in this moment. Sean, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Heather. 
All right, folks, have a great week. We will be back next week with a brand new episode of the Brave Files podcast. And I hope that we'll get to see you in the Brave on Purpose Collective. Be sure to head on over there, vicaryandco.com slash brave on purpose and join a community of people who are just like you, leveraging their fears into intentional bravery. This is Heather Vickery reminding you today and every day to go out and choose bravely. Bye. Hey, friends, I want to share something really exciting with you. We already know you enjoy listening to podcasts because you're listening to this one, but I'm also betting you enjoy audiobooks. And hey, listen, if you don't already enjoy audiobooks, then it's time to check them out. That's why I'm really excited to share Libro.fm with you. They are an incredible new platform for listening to audiobooks. And by choosing Libro.fm over other audiobook services, you are supporting a local bookstore of your choice and investing in your local community. Libro.fm offers over 150,000 audiobooks via their primary platform, which, by the way, they built with love and from scratch because they're a small business also. They even offer bookseller recommendations for great audiobook options. You can sign up right now via www.vickeryandco.com slash librofm. That's vickeryandco.com slash L-I-B-R-O-F-M. And when you do, you'll get one free audiobook of your choice and the proceeds will go to your favorite local bookstore. Now, check what I just said there. You're going to get a free book. And the proceeds are still going to go to your local bookstore because Libro.fm makes sure that their booksellers get paid even when they give a promo to customers. I've listened to over 20 audiobooks this year alone. I especially love listening to memoirs read by the author. And it feels great knowing that all of my purchases support my local bookstore, The Book Table, in Oak Park, Illinois. Libro.fm. The same audiobooks, the same price, but a completely different story. Check them out right now at vickeryandco.com slash librofm. Have you ever thought about starting a podcast? Maybe you've had this thought and then quickly shut it down because who has the time? Or you don't know how, or gosh, it just all seems too hard. If you have something to share with the world, we want to encourage you to get your message out. The world needs to hear it. Did you know that 50% of all homes are podcast fans? If you've ever wondered about having your own podcast or how it can increase your business or get your message across, then please join me and the other experts from the Podcast Power Academy for our monthly free Q&A session. It's called So you want to start a podcast? This casual live conversation will help you understand how podcasting can be a great decision, why now is the best time to get started, and how to get into action with it. Visit podcastpoweracademy.com to learn more. You've been listening to The Brave Files, stories of people living courageously. To learn more about the show, find our show notes, and full episode transcripts, or to get some great bonus content, visit thebravefilespodcast.com. And we would love to know what you think of the show. You can give us a call at 312-646-0205. Let us know your thoughts on the episode, the show in general, or maybe share with us how you're out choosing bravely. This episode is brought to you by Vickery & Co. Success Coaching coaching that helps you maintain a life well-lived and a business well-run. Learn more at vickeryandco.com. Our music was created and produced in a custom collaboration with Matt Lewis from ML Creative Consulting, a boutique firm dedicated to helping clients identify their unique sound and amplify their brand with custom delivered soundtracks. We couldn't do any of this without our extraordinary audio engineer, Andrew Olson. Learn more about him and check out his work at findandrewolson.com. And special thanks to everyone on Team Brave from our producers, associate producers, copy editors, writers, and support team. 
Special thanks to Molly, Mary, Kim, Sabra, and Sabrina. I'm your host and executive producer, Heather Vickery. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next week.